What is dextroconvex scoliosis? Scoliosis is a condition that causes the spine to bend and twist unnaturally. And typically the twist or the rotation is into the concavity of the scoliosis. There are different types of scoliosis and scoliotic curvatures. A dextroconvex scoliosis is a type of dextroscoliosis, meaning the curvature bends to the right. Levoscoliosis or levoconvex scoliosis means curvatures bend to the left. Now, a right scoliosis is considered a typical scoliosis in the thoracic spine because a dextroscoliosis will bend to the right, and that means it's bending away from the heart, which is considered a typical scoliosis in the thoracic spine. An, a an atypical scoliosis in the thoracic spine would bend to the left, and that would be something called a level scoliosis. So we know this is true in the thoracic spine. Right curvatures are considered typical, left curvatures are considered atypical. The opposite is true in the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine, a left lumbar or a level scoliosis is considered typical, and a right is or a dextro is considered atypical. Convex is a further curve specification that the majority of the curvature is rounded to the outside of the curvature, so it's the outside of the curve. So when we look at a dextroconvex scoliosis, as we wonder is how, how severe, how significant can this scoliosis become? We know all types of scoliosis are progressive, so it's in the very nature to become more severe over time. And we know that growth is by far the number one risk factor that triggers progression. All types of scoliosis can range from mild to moderate to severe to very severe. And the more severe the condition, the larger the unnatural spinal curvature exists. The symptoms associated with the dextroconvex scoliosis can also range widely in severity. And some symptom severity can be based upon number of factors, including where the scoliosis is actually located, the patient's age, and curve location, but biggest thing is the curve size. Mild scoliosis symptoms can be very subtle, and the more severe condition is, the more noticeable the scoliosis can, can become. The main symptom in children typically involves postural changes, such as uneven shoulders, uneven hips, uneven rib cage, uneven scapula presentation, uneven waist, and normally we see this postural involvement that normally will trigger further examination and potentially x-rays to actually diagnose the scoliosis. The main symptom is normally pain, and this pain is a result of the scoliosis because we know scoliosis in adult forms become compressive once you become skeletally mature. And the compression over time as a result of gravity can lead to pain and compression of muscles, tissues, and nerves. So therefore, what brings on the diagnosis in an adult patient is typically pain, an x-ray is taken, and they find scoliosis. We know that the area surrounding the scoliosis is effective negatively as a result of the scoliosis. And normally, this is normally directly affects that area that where the scoliosis is developing. But we also know it can affect the entire spine and body negatively. When we look at dextroscoliosis, it has very typical features. And we look at a dextroconvex scoliosis in the thoracic spine, it will be a right bending curvatures. And the majority of these cases are considered idiopathic cases. Idiopathic scoliosis means there's no associated single cause for the scoliosis. This is occurring for a multiple of reasons that somebody can't identify in these patients. These are normal, healthy patients. For whatever reason, they're developing for a scoliosis for an unknown reason. We consider scoliosis, like I mentioned, multifactorial. There's 80 or so theories on causation, and nobody can tell any single one person why they're developing idiopathic scoliosis. 80% of all cases are considered to be idiopathic. The remaining 20% of cases are associated with known causes, and these are things like neuromuscular scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, and congenital scoliosis. Dextroconvex scoliosis is a treatable condition. There's no treatment guarantees. But however, if we treat dextroconvex scoliosis early during the progressive st stages, it can be reduced and managed, particularly when we detect it early and we combine that early detection with early inter intervention, there's much fewer limitations that can be achieved with non-surgical treatment options. Many cases of scoliosis don't require surgical intervention, especially when they're treated properly. Now, when we look at non-surgical treatment for scoliosis, the first thing we wanna look at is a conservative 
chiropractic-centered treatment the approach that is referred to as a functional treatment approach because the goal is at working towards maintaining the spine's natural strength and function by reducing the size of curvature, improving strength and stability. Conservative treatment is normally integrated, meaning it combines many scoliosis-specific treatment disciplines to impact the scoliosis on many different levels. So treatment plans are fully customized. The most effective forms of scoliosis treatment must address the size of the curvature, meaning the structure of the spine, the muscle asymmetry, the shape of the body, and we also must look at endurance and ligament flexibility. So normally we involve many different types of therapies and treatments, things like chiropractic care, physical therapy, scoliosis-specific exercises, corrective bracing, rehabilitation. These are all coordinated to act and impact the scoliosis on a structural level by increasing spinal support and stability through strengthening, balancing, and supporting all the muscles and tissues around the spine. Dextroconvex scoliosis can be treated proactively and we're starting the scoliosis treatment as close to the time as diagnosis is by far the most important factor because it gives the scoliosis the least amount of time to progress. Unfortunately, traditional treatment approaches normally don't address scoliosis until they become severe. And at that stage, they start considering spinal fusion and surgery, which can be very, very invasive. When treatment is started early in the condition's progressive line, we definitely know the spine is more responsive to conservative treatment and is less likely to become severe over time. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you have any questions about this topic or other scoliosis questions, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish new videos just like this.